name is Doug Reeves, and I'm really delighted to welcome you to this uh, special session of how to do grading reform in three easy steps. Um, we know that grading reform is one of the most controversial subjects in American education today, but I will tell you, I just this week have seen evidence of how well it's working. Uh, if, if nothing else compels you to be part of this discussion, I want to make sure that a, you're going to have the opportunity to give me your participation, your feedback, and your pushback, because I realize that reasonable people can differ about these ideas. So I want to make sure that you feel welcome, even if you disagree with some of these ideas on grading reform. But B, and most ex importantly, and, and what excites me, is seeing this really work. We are seeing failure reductions of 70 to 80 percent around the United States. Just last week in a school, uh, a high school that had resisted this for years, started grading reform that we'll talk about today in three easy steps, add six sections of electives for the 22-23 school year because they eliminated six sections of repeaters. So the case I'm going to make to you today is that grading reform is good for all of us. It's good for teachers, it's good for communities, it's good for families, it's good for certainly students who are struggling, but it's also good for your highest performing students because every section of, a, of repeaters that we eliminate is a section of uh, advanced classes, AP classes, high interest classes that you and I can add. So this is going to be exciting because it's in everybody's best interest. So let's get to the meat of the day and let me, there we go. So you should be able to see, uh, see my slide and those of you who know me know that I'm really serious about this first one where I give you my personal contact information. Um, that means that you may say, well, Doug, you're preaching to the choir here. This is great for us, but you need to be talking to my third grade team or my math department in my high school or my social studies department in my middle school. Uh, take me up on those offers. I really learn from those dialogues that I have. So if you want to have some extended conversation as a result of today's webinar, please take me up on that. I'm, I'm on a real passion here to reduce the failure rate in the United States and around the world. And if that's something that would help you, uh, just a brief conversation, I'm more than happy to do it. Just yesterday, I spoke to a union president who was remarkably supportive and cooperative. I've spoken to board members, to district leaders, and you know people in the trenches in the classroom. Uh, wh whatever audience you think will be most helpful for you to get grading reform done right, I want you to know that you can count on me and that I'm not going to have one of these you know, three-hour disquisitions on the 50-point plan for grading reform. We're going to talk about three simple steps that can make it work for you and make it work for your schools and communities. Now, number one, some learning protocols. You can stop me anytime. Please use the chat room. We've got a relatively small group, so it's also okay to unmute yourself and just uh, say, hey, Doug, wait a minute. I'm not sure that I get this, or I get it, but my colleague doesn't. So please stop anytime. Don't wait for me to ask you for participation. I want you to represent the people who are not here. What about students? What, what about parents? What about some of the people who just don't want to have one more webinar or their head is going to explode? But seriously, think about people who are not here that you might represent. And again, I want to assure you that this is a safe place for divergent thinking. One of the things that you and I as educators need to do is to model what civil discourse looks like. So if you disagree with me, God bless you, that's fine. Uh, I know I don't get everything right the first time. All I ask is that we engage in civil discourse, not only because I think that is good adult learning, but colleagues, our students in our country needs to see people like us who can disagree with each other and we're still friends at the end of the day. So if you have a different point of view, please feel safe to express that. And I promise you next time I see you, I'll buy you a beer, we'll still be friends. So it's okay to disagree. Uh, let's model civil discourse for the country and for our students. Here's what I wanna to try to get done in our time together. I wanna to reframe the conversation away from just grading to feedback. And I'm gonna ask you to think about the best feedback that you've ever received. I wanna make sure that we recognize that there are concerns about grading reform. You know, I, I have good friends who write these books, and write these articles, as I have, about grading reform. And we assume that truth, justice, and righteousness is on our side. Wait a minute. The people who are on the other side who oppose grading reform have got some really solid points of view. And we're not going to get anywhere by just having this headbutting exercise. Let's respect and consider 
that the people who oppose trading reform have a legitimate point of view, and I'm gonna to try to respect that today. Then we'll ask you to, for the criteria for great feedback. I'm gonna give you the three simple steps to uh, implement grading reform. Note well, not the three-year, five-year strategic Stalinist plan, three simple steps that we can get done right now. You can literally do them before the end of the semester. And then we'll talk about the implication for boards and superintendents. So let's first of all uh, talk about the conversation about uh, about grading. We're doing all about feedback. Um, and by the way, if, if you're not participating, please uh, just, just turn your microphone on mute. Yeah. And I'll make that happen. Colleagues, I need to ask you to mute yourself, please. Well, it's just it's something that really, really. There we go. Thank you. Okay, back to. So focus on feedback. Um, let's see if we can find common ground. We all want the same thing. And that means that we have feedback that's accurate and fair. Uh, everybody wants the same thing. Whether we disagree about the details of grading reform, we all want accurate and fair feedback. Uh, we also want policies that encourage personal responsibility. One of the things that I hear teachers complain about who oppose grading reform is you're just suborning bad behavior. Kids need to learn personal responsibility. I agree. We just want to make sure that we get the consequences right. And the consequences for bad behavior need to be something that actually works. If Fs and zeros, point deductions and threats worked, then you'd think that we, all the work this year would be on time and perfect. We know that's not true. But nevertheless, we all agree that students ought to have personal responsibility. And we want to make sure that we encourage that personal responsibility as well as perseverance, resilience, all those social and emotional skills that you and I have been working on for the last several years. So let's be clear about what does not change. This is, by the way, a big issue in every change leadership initiative that you might lead. Don't talk about there's a new sheriff in town, here's what's gonna change. Talk about what does not change. For example, at the secondary level, we're not gonna change ABCDF grading. I think schools that are trying to take high school grades into narratives, into numbers, into something that parents are uncomfortable with or having the entirely wrong argument. If your culture is ABCDF grading, traditional GPAs that have transcripts, scholarship applications, and college applications, don't mess with that. Assure people about what does not change. We're still gonna have those traditional things that, that parents like, and also we're gonna still have academic honors. Though I would argue, Let's make those academic honors more accurate and more reflective of the values that the secondary school faculty holds rather than these bizarre notions that a 3.99995 is different from a 3.99994, but really have academic honors that mean something. It's the way Harvard does it, the way a lot of pretty good schools do it, and that's to have highest honors, high honors, and honors. That's what I'll ask you to consider as we go through our discussions today. Let us also acknowledge the frustrations that many faculty members have with grading reform. I think sometimes we give these short shrift like, well, if you don't agree with me, you just don't get it. I wanna respect the fact that there are people who disagree with me and they deserve a respectful hearing. For example, one of the things that I just heard yesterday is faculty members who are really upset about students who had missed a ton of school come in two days before the final and say, give me all the stuff take your time after school because I want to retake everything. They are really tired of being sandbagged. So we need to have effective consequences for students who miss class, who miss work. It may not be failing them, but it's also not putting the entire burden on the teacher to have endless retakes so that they feel sandbagged at the end of the year. Um, students lack self-reliance. Of course, we want students to be self-reliant. That means that we have to give them feedback throughout the year. Feedback that says you're going to fail no matter what, no matter how hard you work, no matter how resilient you are, no matter how self-reliant you are, you're going to flunk in May because of the mistakes that you made in February 
don't teach that. We want to think of ways that will encourage self-reliance. Uh, and what about kids who get it right the first time? I hear this a lot from teachers who are genuinely concerned about our responsible and high achieving students. And brother, I sure hear about it from their parents. My kid got it right the first time. And why should that kid who only got it right after months of laziness and then working hard and then getting feedback from their teacher and finally getting up here, why should that kid get the same grade? It's a fair question. And it's a question that we have to address based upon our commitment to how we evaluate students compared to standards versus evaluating them as we did in the 20th century based upon the bell curve. And of course, we want to make sure that we consider the rights of teachers. Some states, for example, California among them, give teachers the right to have the final grade. So just because I've got some research that says there's a better way to do things does not necessarily undermine the right of the teacher to use their best professional judgment. So let's think about how we can take seriously these concerns with grading reforms as we go ahead. Now, I've been talking long enough. It's time for me to stop and to listen to you. And I'm going to give you a minute of think time to use the chat room and answer the following question. What are the criteria that you've experienced for the best feedback you've ever had? Maybe as an educator, maybe as an administrator, maybe it was a uh, when you were on a job outside of education, maybe it's when you were a student, take 60 seconds and give me the criteria for the best feedback you've ever had. See you back here in 60 seconds. Thirty more seconds, please. Thank you. Really thoughtful ideas here. Take a look at the chat room and you'll see how thoughtful your colleagues are. And back to large group, please, in five, four, three, two, and one. When you look at the chat room, you'll see some common themes that emerge. And I have tried to encapsulate those in the acronym FAST, which stands for fair, accurate, specific, and timely. And the reason I know you're here to talk about grading, but if we'll put this in the context of feedback, if you know what the criteria for great feedback will be, as you've just identified them in the chat room, then that tells you what do we want the criteria for effective grading to be? Because grading is just one form of many of feedback. So let's just focus on each part of the, that acronym, FAST, fair, accurate, specific, and timely. Fairness is all about consistency. Think of it you know, on, on the rules of the game. You got three officials on the football field or on the court or watching the finishing line of a track meet. You expect that those officials have coordinated well enough and understand the rules of the game well enough that not necessarily perfectly, but most of the time come to the very same conclusion. Different people look at the same performance and come to the same or very similar conclusions. That's fair. If different officials always had different opinions, the students would throw up their hands and say, we don't know what the rules of the game are and that's not fair. And by the way, colleagues, what happens when students think that a game is unfair they stop playing the game. Now, the antidote to unfairness is collaborative scoring. And if you want to take away an actionable idea from today's webinar, make sure that at your next professional learning community meeting or whatever you call your teams of teachers, you engage in collaborative scoring where teachers will look at an anonymous piece of student work. They'll evaluate it individually who thinks it's proficient, who thinks it's advanced, who thinks it's approaching, who thinks it's not meeting standards, whatever your terminology may be, four, three, two, one, or 
A, B, C, D. And if you've got a group of 10 teachers and nine out of 10 agree, oh, this one's proficient or this one's approaching or this one is not meeting standards, great. But if among those 10 teachers, you have some who say it's four and some it's a three, some it's a two, some it's a one, that is the definition of unfairness. And when the rules of the game are so unclear, students won't play the game. The same is true in grading policy. In studies that I've done of more than 10,000 teachers and administrators, I found that the very same student work can get an A, a B, a C, a D, or an F based not on the quality of the work, but based upon the individual grading systems of the teachers. It's not fair. Next, it's got to be accurate. You know, as colleagues, we can disagree on a lot of stuff. I'm sure we probably do on this call. But one of the things I hope we all agree on is this principle of accuracy. So let me just speak to you as a, as a math teacher who had two thirds of my class not speaking English at home. Was I really grading math or was I grading English language literacy with numbers in it? So one of the things that we wanna make sure that we do is have accurate grading so that we can differentiate clearly between the different grades. Now here's a challenge I would offer to all of you on this call. Every educator on this call can clearly tell me what the difference is between an A, a B, a C, a D or an F. I trust you. I trust you with my own kids to say, Doug, here's what Sarah needs to do to move from a C to a B, from a B to an A. I trust you in that. But you want to know what nobody can do? Nobody can tell me the difference between the 23 and 24, the 59 and 60, or more to the point, the arguments you're going to have in the weeks ahead, the 89 and the 90. Gee, Mr. Reeves, how many extra points do I need to get to get moved from an 89 to a 90? It's a fundamentally disrespectful conversation that exemplifies the inaccuracy of grading because these small little point differences are what our AP stat teachers will tell us is a distinction without a difference. And so the big categories, A, B, C, D, F, we can differentiate. The tiny categories, 90, 89, 87, 30, 32, 31, are things that we cannot necessarily accurately distinguish. And so accuracy, like, fr like fairness, depends upon a high degree of consistency. And if you want something that will bring your faculty together, focus on our common values. We can disagree on a lot of stuff, colleagues, but we'll all agree on accuracy and fairness. So remember the acronym FAST, FAIR, ACCURATE. The S is specific. Tell me exactly what I need to do to improve. I'll tell you what teachers who are the victims of some of these dumb protocols where people are doing classroom observations just hate is these generic feedback. Oh, students should be more engaged. Sure enough, I knew that. Tell me specifically exactly what I need to do to get better. Um, you know, if, if I need to get better in lesson planning, in classroom management, in feedback to my students, tell me exactly what I need to do to improve. Similarly, students need to know exactly what to do. If all they see is a sea of red ink on an essay, on a lab report, they don't know what to do to get better. Tell me exactly what I can do to, to improve my performance. Now, by the way, if you're gonna work hard enough, as I know you all do, to give students that level of feedback, then you gotta make sure that they respect your feedback. How's the only way that you know that they respected your feedback? That they actually used it to improve their performance. I feel so strongly about this. I'll tell you what I did as a teacher, is that the best you could do for your first draft was half credit. You, I worked too hard giving you feedback to have you ignore the feedback. So you can get half credit, then I don't care if you're the valedictorian, you always have to do a second draft. That's one of those skills, by the way, of perseverance, of respect for feedback that will help them in college, help them in the world of work. Too many of our students are used to getting one shot and they're done. And too many teachers say, no retakes, get it right the first time. When they do that, what they're saying is, my feedback is irrelevant. My coaching and support for you doesn't matter. I believe that you work way too hard to let that proposition stand. Your feedback does matter and your feedback deserves respect. And if it's specific enough, students will use it and they'll get better. So let's go back to fast, fair, accurate, specific. What's the T? Timely. Timely is all about getting feedback 
in time to actually use it. And the very best way to do that is during class. I'm seeing more and more teachers change their approach to student work from homework, from assignments that are turned in days later, feedback that is even days after that, to getting it done in real time so that students get immediate and specific feedback. And as these warm days, this is being recorded in April of 2022, these warm days of spring and oncoming summer are coming up, students are lethargic, they're exhausted, their heads are in the desk, get them out of their chairs. What I'm seeing more and more creative teachers do is get them out of their chair, do the problems. I don't care whether it's a set in physics, whether it's a, a set of arguments in social studies or, or English, whether it's a set of problems in algebra, get them out of their chairs, doing it on the board, all four corners of the classroom covered with paper or whiteboards, get them to do the work right then so you can see in real time the errors that they're making in real time, immediately give them feedback, have them respect your feedback and then apply it. So fast feedback, fair, accurate, specific, timely. Now, the real world in which you and I must live, despite all those efforts, we'll still have some kids turn in work either not at all or turn it in late. So what's the consequence of that? For about 400 years, we're celebrating in just a few years, the 400th anniversary of public education in the United States. We have been trying the following. Fs, zeros, point deductions for late work, office referrals. If a kid doesn't turn in work, go to the principal's office. Threats, colleagues, is any of that working? Because if it is, you ought to be able to say, Doug, as a result of 400 years of failures, zeros, uh, and, and threats, then all the work's on time and perfect because they're so afraid of those Fs and zeros. Nobody believes that. Come on, we gotta come up with consequences that work. So I'm gonna give you some ideas because I believe in consequences too. I just don't believe in grading as punishment because the evidence says that it doesn't work. So here's three things that I promised you at the outset, three things that you and I can do. Number one, ban the average. Number two, use simple A, B, C, D, F grading. A is a four, B is a three, C is a two, D is a one, F is a zero. So ban the average, go back to simple A, B, C, D, F grading and get the practice done in class, not at home. Let's take apart each one of those three simple steps that I'm advocating today. Step one, ban the average. Now, colleagues, many of you in the last two years since the advent of the school closures accompanying the COVID pandemic have said, oh, Doug, we got to take care of social and emotional learning. We really believe in SEL. We want to have perseverance. We want to have resilience. We want to have all the emotional learning that kids need. If you really believe that and you've spent a lot of time and money and resources on SEL, you can't use the average. Because you want to know what the average says? The average says, forget about resilience. Forget about perseverance. Forget about all that stuff we said in SEL, because all that matters is how you did throughout the entire semester. I will punish you in May for the mistakes you made in September and in January. You can't both say, I believe in SEL and use the average. And I'll, I know some of you are saying on oh, my computer system makes me do it. I'll deal with that in a second. But if you believe in SEL, you can't use the averages. That's straightforward. Moreover, it's also about you. Great teachers add value to students. Think of the profile. Maybe you've had it as students. Some of us like me have had it as learners of struggle and struggle and struggle and struggle and breakthrough. Don't you wanna honor the breakthrough? Don't you wanna support that breakthrough? That's my best days as a teacher are those breakthroughs. And when we use the average, we say the breakthrough doesn't matter because I'm still going to punish you for those times during the struggle. But times when teachers add the very greatest value is that time during the struggle where they help students persevere through the struggle and ultimately achieve the breakthrough. If that's the profile of your professional practices, if that's the profile of your students, you can't use the average. Now, there's a couple of things that are corollaries to this issue of, at, of, of getting rid of the average. Some of you are, um, are, are stuck on this um, uh, minimum 50. And I, I've, I've heard this all over the place. You can avoid that whole problem 
if you simply um, avoid using the average because the minimum 50 was used as an antidote to the zero on the 100 point scale. And if you just go back to the traditional ABCDF 43210, you'll avoid, you can still have a zero, but it's math math mathematically accurate. If you get rid of the average, then you won't have to worry about whether the minimum score is a zero or a 50. So step two, simple ABCDF grading. Keep it simple. GPAs, think of the way that your transcripts look, are always on a four-point scale. People have a 3.5, 3.7, 4.0, or depending on the bizarre calculus of some grading systems, a 5.0 or a 6.0, whatever. They're typically on a zero to four scale, zero to five, whatever works for you. But why do we still, if that's true, have the 100 point scale in the classroom? It doesn't make any sense. The 100 point scale historically is due to the early 20th century when we started having intelligence tests on a 100 point scale, where we could prove you know, with scientific certainty, with mathematical certainty uh, that, let's see, the British, that's it. The British were superior to the Irish Scandinavians were superior to the Italians. You can let the racism go on and on from there. It was the illusion of precision. The 100 point scale is not the way we've done grades for most of American history. It is, it is the illusion of precision of the early 20th century and you don't need to use it. I know that your electronic grading systems default to zero to 100, but you can change that. You can change it from zero to four. A is a four, B is a three, C is a two, D is a one, F is a zero. And the reason you wanna do that is that that allows you to have clear demarcations, A, B, C, D, F, which are clear. What do I need to do, sir, in order to move from a C to a B? Ma'am, what do I need to do to move from a B to an A? Students will tell you then what they need to learn and show and do to get better. That is the opposite of the conversation. How many extra points do I need to get to move from an 89 to a 90? A fundamentally disrespectful conversation that is all about points and not about learning. So I wanna suggest that one of the best things that we can do in addition to getting rid of the average is getting rid of that 100 point scale, go back to a traditional ABCDF. And I know what you're thinking, but, but I have students and parents who, who really wanna know the difference between an 84 and an 85 enroll them in AP statistics, or they will learn that those one point difference are not significant in statistical terms. They are a distinction without a difference. What is important is the difference between the C and the B, the B and the A, not the difference between 82 and 83, or more to the point, 89 and 90. Now, step three, practice in class. So let's review. Step one means we're gonna get rid of the average. Step two, we're gonna get rid of the 100 point scale and go to four points, a, traditional, A, B, C, D, F, not new, very traditional. Step three, practice in class. Now, when I was teaching graduate statistics classes and graduate assessment classes, I would make my students attend a basketball practice because I wanted to have them see the relationship between practice and performance. And they could see it immediately when they watched the practice and then we would watch the game. And so what do we call most practice today? It's homework. And yet every time, every time bar none, I ask educators, why is it that we assign homework? Because kids need practice. Of course they do. We all agree that they need practice. So the only question before the house is, what are the hallmarks of effective practice? Well, the hallmarks of effective practice are that I get coaching immediately. I respond to my coach. I respect my coach. I apply what my coach says to do, and then I get better. You see that in athletics. You see that in music. Why in the world can't we do that in social studies and chemistry and in algebra, where I get immediate feedback and immediately respect that feedback, apply what I've learned, and get better? Now, there's one more thing that I think we just have to have honest conversations about. I've interviewed teachers who stopped doing homework and started getting practice in class and here's what they told me. When we stopped doing homework and started having practice in class, we finally had honest conversations about what students knew and what they did not know. Because when they submit that perfect homework, thanks Khan Academy, thanks Google, thanks older siblings, thanks parents, then I have to pretend that I'm perfect. 
I can't honestly tell the teacher what I don't know. By contrast, when I actually do those practice sessions in class, I make mistakes, I can honestly tell the teacher what I'm struggling with, and I can get corrections that I would never get when I engage in this illusion of perfection, which is what perfect homework does. So I know a lot of you are frustrated by missing homework. I'm just as frustrated by perfect homework as I am by missing homework because the perfect homework may or may not represent what the student has actually done. So let's talk about some political realities here. I know you're thinking, well, Doug, that would be ideal, except in our district, we have activist parents who demand homework. And maybe some of you demand it as well for your own kids. Fully for you, that's great. You can still have homework menus. Let me show you what teachers have done around the country. They can say, if you want to do homework, God bless you. We appreciate that. Here's a menu of things to do. Write a family history. Uh, there's abundant evidence by people like me and Stephen Graham and, and, and many others who show that nonfiction writing is a very strong lever for improved student achievement. Write a family history. Interview some elders. Write a neighborhood newspaper. I've done that with elementary kids. Uh, prepare meals that involve a having and doubling and tripling recipes. You can work on those math skills. And, and go out and observe nature. A, a prize-winning MIT scientist who wrote this wonderful book called In Praise of Wasting Time says, I didn't get to be an MIT scientist by going home and doing three hours of AP biology homework. I became an MIT scientist by going out and looking at toads and frogs and nature and walking up and down the creek in Tennessee. That's what this fellow did. Alan Lickman, by the way, is his name. And those are the kind of people that, that really understood the glorious gifts that we find in nature and avoid the stultifying impact of simply thinking that everything comes from books. There's a lot of things that you and I can do in lieu of the odd numbered problems one through 30. So all I'm saying is if your parents demand homework, give them a menu, let kids do this kind of work, but stop making every single kid do the same thing in assuming that their failure to do that is a mark of great character or their perfection in doing that is a mark of brilliance. Neither one of those assumptions is true. Now, I want to address one of the biggest frustrations that people have, and that is, but what about these kids who just are stubborn and they're indolent and they're lazy and they just won't do the work? Here are some things I've seen around the country. I'll just describe them briefly and maybe in the Q&A session, we can have more discussion about this. Catch-up solution. Uh, this was started by a school. Just to give you a sense of scale, it was about 1,100 kids, had 385 failures. When they started having catch-up Fridays, nobody's going to go into the weekend without the work getting done. They got all the work caught up on Fridays. They went from 385 failures to 15. They cut their suspension rate in half. They increased their attendance. I've seen since I published that article, this replicated around the United States, getting work done, not after there's a giant hole, not at the end of the semester, but every single week. In fact, I've seen other schools that say, well, if that worked, let's do it twice a week. Well, let's do it three times a week. Let's do it every day where they get the work done. Now, what about those kids who already do their work? Great. They are rewarded with something that kids, and in particular, adolescents and pre-adolescents value, freedom, time. And kids who don't have their work in get a punishment that's way worse than an F or a zero, constraints on freedom, constraints on time. The catch-up solution really works. The red, yellow, green room, that allowed, again, teachers a full week for students and teachers to interact. But if your work's not squared away by Friday morning, then the red list means you're in danger of failing my class. The yellow list means you're, you're uh, missing several assignments. And the consequences included just one-to-one -one contact with teachers and administrators, looking in backpacks, checking assignment notebooks, checking to make sure that they had their pencils and papers. Look, this is not a big deal. It's not a big invasion. It just says, hey, there's federally funded studies that say coming to class prepared is highly related to student achievement. Let's make sure you're prepared for class. Kids hate that. And they hate it bad enough that in this school, a little bit bigger, about 1,700 kids, the first semester, they just started looking in backpacks and making sure that kids had school supplies ready to go. They had 180 fewer failures. That's six sections of repeaters that they avoided, six sections of electives that they could add. 
the quiet table at lunch. What was interesting about this one is that some kids had to sit at the quiet table. A lot of kids volunteered to sit there. And there's a lot of social value in having kids who are organized, getting their work done, sitting next to kids who were disorganized and needed help on executive function. Moreover, it, it again, hit the kids where they live. Oh, you'd like to eat with your friends? All you gotta do is get your work done, squared away. Coach's Corner, before you suit up, before you go to practice with your teammates, you gotta have your homework done. This was brilliant. And took some of the most respected people in our schools, our athletic coaches, and put them on the same side of the table as our academic support team. And citizenship grades, I've seen this used really well. You believe that behavior and time management organization is important, so do I. Call it behavior, time management organization, stop calling it algebra in history. And what about the staff who doesn't buy in? I, I understand that. I'm, I'm not actually asking for buy-in. In the book, Deep Change Leadership, I wrote about the myth of buy-in. I think it's fundamentally disrespectful to beg and plead for buy-in. I think a more respectful approach to faculty who disagrees with me is to say, I respect the fact that you disagree. Um, all I wanna do is ask for a fair chance. I wanna ask for maybe one semester where you get the work done in class, maybe one semester where you don't use the average, maybe one semester where you use 4321 grading. I've seen this with deeply experienced union veterans. And when they try it, then they'll say, we didn't need Doug Reeves, we got this figured out ourselves. Precisely correct. That's inside out change. That's where people like Mr. Michael Dahl, who was a leader in this um, idea in California, has been able to say, I didn't believe Doug. I tried it. It worked in my classroom, in our culture, with our union bargaining agreement, with our agenda, with our budget. When the best research you'll ever have is not, alas, from me or anybody else. It's what you do when you prove what works in your own culture. That's inside out change. Local evidence beats external evidence every single time. And then of course, what if some people still disagree? I guess all I would say colleagues is that I think the issue of avoiding student failure is a safety and value issue. And at some point, I, I'd like you to ask this. If, if you had a bus driver who said, you know, these traffic regulations, they just don't work for me. And, and, and I don't really wanna take anybody else's advice on that. Uh, I'm gonna run red lights. I'm gonna have the kids swinging from the uh, sidelines here. You wouldn't tolerate that. You, you had a cafeteria manager. You know, I don't know, this hygiene stuff, that just doesn't work for me. You wouldn't tolerate it. If it's a safety issue, we all agree. And the case I would like to make for you is after we've had a fair chance for inside out change, if you still have people who disagree, then failure is a safety issue. Kids who fail in school, particularly kids who fail and ultimately leave our K-12 education system are at greater risk of poor health, criminal justice system involvement and a lifetime of poverty and un unemployment. At that point, when somebody says, I still wanna punish kids by using the average, I still want to use the zero and the 100 point scale. That's the same thing as the cafeteria manager who says, I don't care about hygiene. The bus driver who says, I don't care about red lights. At some point you say it's a safety issue. Now what's in this for us? There is so much good that you and I can achieve if we will reduce the failure rate. We have fewer repeaters. We have more electives and man, is that motivating. You want to see the morale of your staff soar have more electives, more advanced classes, more high interest classes that I would love to teach if only I didn't have three sections of Algebra One repeaters, uh, better discipline, dramatic improvement in climate and culture, uh, on-time attendance and so on. And of course, greater respect for teachers. That's the number one issue. Grading reform leads to more respect for teachers. Finally, what I wanna talk about is the high achieving students. Too often, this discussion is all about uh, just reducing these and Fs. What about your valedictorian? What about your honor roll kids who do get everything right the first time, for whom the present system is working well? Well, they benefit too from grading reform because every time we have fewer repeaters, we have more advanced classes, more elective classes that helps high achieving students. Everybody benefits from better discipline and safety. Um, and moreover, I think we need to think about the opportunities for high achieving students that will really be uh, supported because A's really mean something. Uh, there's a lot of things that you and I can do 
that in terms of grading reform that don't just reduce Ds and Fs, but also help high achieving students as well. So that's it. Three simple steps, ban the average, use simple ABCDF grades, 43210, and practice in class, not at home. So what I wanna do is to give you an opportunity uh, to either, you can use the raise hand function because we've had a lot more people join us now. And um, all I'm gonna ask you to do is use the raise hand function. We've still got um, just about 10 more minutes and I'll make sure that I answer questions. And remember colleagues, this is a safe place for dissent, a safe place for disagreement. So know that your, uh, uh, that, that your ideas will be respected. Uh, it's, I'm afraid I have an eye problem, so it's a little difficult. I see that Thomas has got his hand raised. So would you please uh, unmute yourself? And Thomas, I, I, I apologize, I, I can't read your last name. So would you please unmute yourself and let us know your question? Um, oh, I, I, I'm sorry, it's not Thomas, it, it must be, uh, now that I see your picture, but, but would you please unmute yourself? Yeah. I, I, I see your hand raised, look. look. Um, is that for me, Tracy? Hi. I wasn't Thank sure you. if there's somebody else. <laughs> okay. Yes, please go ahead. Okay, so um, I come from a counseling background. I I um, remember about twenty years ago listening to a Tim or Tom, somebody uh, about standards based grading and taking out that zero and um, just fully supportive of that. I think for me, when I work with teachers, it's the how when we're doing the zero one two three four or four three two one zero and. Um, I think when they have a rubric for um, projects, uh, tests, um, homework assignments, or not homework, but you know, things like that, it, it's okay. Like they get the that part. But when we're talking about the daily assignments and the things that they work on, that practice, you know, in class, how then does that translate to the four three two one zero? and then work into the overall grade? That's one question. I have two, but I don't know if I wanna give it to you let, now. Let, 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 let's stop and address that one first. First okay. of all, how does it work? You know, the, the, I do believe that practice is important and I do support teachers who wanna put practice into the grade book. What you don't have to do is to calculate that into the final grade. And in most electronic grading systems, you can simply decide with a check or an uncheck whether or not that evidence that you put in about practice goes into the final grade. So there's no problem at all about putting in that daily practice. You don't have to hold students um, it, responsible in terms of uh, influencing their final grade in May for the mistakes that they made in February, but you can put it in there. You just don't have to calculate it in the final grade. So that's kind of big idea number one. And big idea number two, Kit, you know as a counselor better than I do, students value consistency. So if you're gonna use a, B, C, D, F, which corresponds to 43210, do that on everything. Don't one minute, it's a B, and the next minute, it's a 65, and the next minute, it's a C, and the next minute, it's an 82. Just do everything, A, B, C, D, F. It's the most simple and clear and consistent way to evaluate students. You had one more item. Um, I do. When we talked about um, increasing you know, the grade they end with, tends to be the grade that they get, you know, they get better, um, work also gets harder, you know, it starts off easy in the beginning, right? I've had um, social studies and science teachers with um, standards that are very different, have a little bit of hard time with this, because what they had taught in the beginning of the year, the standards they addressed, end up being different standards. So they may have failed for two reasons, the type of work they were doing, the standard at that time, and laziness in the beginning of the year. I don't know. You know what I mean? And then later on, yeah, maybe they got better, but they didn't hit the same standards. That I, I, seems to be something that has come up as well with this grading. I, I really appreciate how practical your, your question is. You know, I'm a math teacher, so for me, everything's kind of cumulative. What I do at the end of the year includes all the things that we've been building on throughout the year. However, as you so thoughtfully say, social studies may have several different strands. Science, you know, you can't average physics with earth science, with chemistry. They really are different strands. 
So here's how I've seen some teachers thread the needle. Within the strand, let, let's say that that's gonna last for three or four weeks, then I'm not gonna average within that strand because I'm gonna make mistakes in the first week that I don't make in the fourth week. But then when I'm at the fourth week in, in let's say my physical science, then I'm done, that's it. Then I'm gonna start a new strand on earth science. And again, within those four weeks, I'm not gonna average the first week into the fourth week. I'm gonna count what happens in the fourth week, but then I'm done. So I totally respect the fact that my colleagues in social studies and science have a tougher time than I do in math where I can, I can make things cumulative. Similarly, in, in ELA, um, you would expect that the writing that students do uh, gets better and better throughout the year. So that can be cumulative. So ELA and math, we're blessed with the ability to make things more cumulative. I fully respect what you say that science and social studies may have more discrete uh, units that they have to teach. So all I would ask is within the unit, please don't use the average. I see that, um, and, and I, I'm terribly sorry, I just, I really have a hard time seeing this. Uh, is it, you, the, the first two letters are CH? Hi, yes, this is uh, Chanel Segura and I'm uh, with Truth or Consequences Municipal Schools. You came to our district um, yeah. this summer, so uh, thank you for everything. We have implemented um, the four point scale in our district. Um, teachers wanted to move equitable grade to the equitable grade system, which is great, but we have come to find that, um, you know, teachers are putting in four points, three points, two, one, zero for the assignments, but in power school, our SIS, you know, it will average how many ones, twos, and average right. it, so it'll come up to like a, a 2.41. And so students are like, well, is that an A or is that a B or a C? And parents are, are also confused. And it's tough because we have to be able to provide students and families with real-time progress. So for a teacher, we say teachers have that autonomy as the professional to say, you know, you are at a three um, in my class, you're proficient, you know, but not advanced per se. Um, but there's a lot. So we broke down a conversion chart because the average is just, it's hard to fight this average. So when it's averaging that, you know, we say a zero is when a student averages a zero to a 0 0.8, which is an F. A one is a 1.81 to a 1.60. Um, but that goes against doing the averages. So exactly. how do we do that? So so, so let, let me give you a very straight answer. Number one, on power school, I know specifically in every other grading program I've, I've seen, you don't have to default to the average. I know that is the computer company's default, but you don't have to do that. For example, if you had a student who was 111-222-333, the average of that would be two. But the more accurate grade, because of the teacher's great skill in improving performance, was a three. That's how they wound up. So you don't have to default to the average. Uh, the average, I, I know what PowerSchool does, for example, is it can give you that during the semester so that if parents look at a grade, they can say, how is my student doing right now? However, when it comes time to awarding the final grade, you disable the average in the teacher, not PowerSchool. The teacher assigns the final grade. It's really an important concept. Right. Um, and so there is an option to use like mode. How many fours do they have? How many threes? I, would, I wouldn't do that either. No. I, I, I think I struggle because our families and students get very frustrated. Like, okay, what, what is my grade right now? What am I sitting at? Um, and for our teachers who are able um, to, to look at their grade book and, and say, you know what, the student is a three at the end of this quarter, parents will push back and say, why do you think it's a three? Look at what they have. They have all of these, you know, fours. Why didn't you average those in? And so the families have been really tough when it comes to this, to explain some of that stuff. Um, and then for students who are used to getting straight A's, it's been really tough for them. And teachers feel like it's super easy for kids who don't have to try that hard because they can just do one work and, and have a D and just barely do anything to demonstrate proficiency. Well, I, you know, I, I, so a couple of things. Number one, 
Um, if, if, if somebody is getting a lot of fours, I don't understand why their grade wouldn't be an A. Um, with respect to, to parents who complain about other kids, this is a really important thing for administrators to hear because I know you still hear that. Well, that kid over there got this grade and my kid, and we've got to really back up our teachers on this and say, Ms. Jones, I will talk to you all day long about your child's performance. We are not going to spend one second talking about anybody else's child. Right. And, and I know parents do that. I know they compare notes, but we got to back up our teachers about avoiding that kind of comparison. And the reason is, is that the essence of standards, which have been around in this country for more than two decades, is we compare students to a standard, not to each other. Mm -hmm. Parents still do that, but we got to hang tough on comparing them to a standard. Well, colleagues, our time has just evaporated so rapidly. I, I, um, I want to make sure that I remind you of the opportunity to have follow-up questions um, with me and, and that we, uh, we continue to have these conversations. I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm saying, frankly, it's a lot easier than a lot of these 400 page books make them out to be. I think, frankly, a lot of the conversation about grading reform is way too complex. And as a result, no progress has happened. I know districts that'll say, well, Doug, talk to us. Well, what do you wanna do? Well, we want you to you know, make things right. Well, who else have we had? Well, we've had Marzano and Gusky and Warmly and Feldman and everybody else and nothing happens. So I don't think what you need is somebody else to talk to you about it. I think what we need is clarity and simplicity about implementing the key ideas that'll make grading reform work. And if we can do these things, you're gonna make progress immediately. You'll have fewer failures, you'll have fewer repeaters, you'll have more electives, you'll have better faculty morale, you'll have better discipline, all those things that all of us want. So please take these ideas into account. Make sure that you get access to my number and I'll make sure that if you're willing to have a conversation about this and you wanna have a follow-up, talking to your department, talking to your school, talking to your cabinet, your board, your leadership team. I, I want you to know you can count on me to do this. This is really my passion and I'm really happy to help you the best I can. So thanks everybody. Have a great rest of the day. I really appreciate you taking time on a busy day to spend some time talking to me. Take care. Thank you.